in this lecture we are going to explore the structure of uh, materials at the most basic of length scales namely the atomic scale it's an interesting experimental fact that the vast majority of materials or solids that's uh, currently known occur in crystalline form meaning that the atoms that the material is composed of are arranged in a regular pattern in real space the reality of this uh, regular uh, arrangement of atoms in a crystal was first convincingly demonstrated by the x-ray crystallographers uh, this body of work uh, goes all the way back to 1913 uh, due largely to uh, von lawe and uh, the father and son bragg and many other workers let us start with the most basic of definitions that describe a crystal which you can see at the top of this uh, screen namely that a crystal can be viewed as a combination of a lattice and a basis let's define what these two things are the lattice is essentially a mathematical construct and it is a, a collection of uh, regularly or periodically spaced points in in space in real space and the basis is nothing but a collection of one or more atoms of one or many different types associated with each lattice point let's write these things down okay so there we have it the lattice is a mathematical construct and the basis is a collection of uh, one or more atoms associated with each lattice point and together the lattice and the basis define the crystal let us now illustrate this using an example in 2d or two dimensional space and we are going to use this example to define some basic notions basic concepts okay so here is a two dimensional lattice essentially a collection of points in this uh, two dimensional space regularly spaced points and bear in mind that uh, this is uh, not a crystal yet it's it's only a lattice as we have not really uh, associated uh, one or more atoms with any of these lattice points so at this point it's just this is just a mathematical construct a collection of uh, regularly spaced points in two dimensional space now we are going to use this lattice to define um, some important concepts as i just said one way to define a lattice mathematically is by uh, using these things called unit cells i'm sure many of you have heard of uh, uh, unit cells and let me give some examples of unit cells i'm i'm just going to draw uh, one possible unit cell that can define this lattice so there it is so that's a unit cell The interesting thing about unit cells is that when they are translated uh, periodically, they can actually replicate the entire lattice. In other words, you can tile uh, this two-dimensional plane with this uh, rectangular unit cell and recreate the entire two-dimensional lattice. Let's make an important and interesting observation here. Uh, in fact, let me ask this question. how many lattice points does this unit cell contain if you think about it a little bit you will realize that it contains uh, two lattice points the reason it is uh, easy to figure out why there are just two lattice points per rectangular unit cell the four lattice points at the corners of this rectangle contribute a quarter lattice point each to this uh, unit cell and the one at the center contributes an entire lattice point and so that's a total of uh, two lattice points per cell let me draw another example of a unit cell and i leave it as an exercise to figure out how many lattice points this contains right so there's another example and here is another one which is very special 
because it contains exactly one lattice point per cell. And for this reason, this smallest uh, unit cell that I just drew is called a primitive cell. Let me write this down. So to reiterate, the primitive cell is a special cell which is the smallest possible unit cell you can imagine for a given lattice containing exactly one lattice point. While we are in this topic of uh, primitive cells, let me now introduce a new uh, cell, uh, namely the Wigner site cell, which turns out to be a very special type of uh, primitive cell. It turns out that the Wigner site cell is the most spherically shaped uh, primitive cell you can possibly imagine, and its construction can be uh, explained in this in this manner. Consider any lattice point. Uh, let us say we are considering this particular lattice point and consider the nearest neighbors of that particular lattice point which in this particular case happens to be uh, these, these six other points. Next, let us consider the line that connects uh, our original lattice point to the six uh, nearest neighbors. Let's draw one of them. Uh, and let's now create a perpendicular bisector of that particular line which I'm going to draw in red, which is uh, like that. Likewise, we draw the perpendicular bisector uh, for all the other lines that connect our original lattice point to the nearest neighbor lattice point. And when you do that, you get this nice looking hexagon for this particular lattice. So this hexagon is essentially the primitive, uh, I'm sorry, the Wigner site cell for uh, this, this, this chosen two-dimensional lattice. So this is our Wigner site cell. So the Wigner site cell, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is the most spherical primitive cell you can imagine for a given lattice. And interestingly, uh, it also displays the full symmetry of the underlying lattice. In this particular case, it's a, it's a hexagonal symmetry that is actually revealed by the construction of this Wigner site cell. Using this two-dimensional lattice and the unit cells we have constructed so far, uh, let me introduce uh, another set of interesting and important concepts, namely the concept of uh, unit vectors, which I'm going to draw now for one of our primitive cells uh, using blue lines. So I'm labeling these two unit vectors A1 and A2 and because this is a two-dimensional lattice we need uh, uh, two vectors, two such uh, unit cell vectors to completely specify our unit cell and by extension the entire two-dimensional lattice. Let us now make two important observations. The first one is that all the lattice points are equivalent and the second one is that given any reference point, any reference lattice point, we can reach any other lattice point through a vector which is a linear combination of these two unit vectors A1 and A2. So R is a new vector which can connect any lattice point to any other lattice point. And of course, L and M are integers and A1 and A2 are, are original uh, unit cell vectors. We are going to use the notions we have learned so far and move on to three-dimensional systems. And throughout the process, we are going to keep introducing new, newer concepts. The first one is this thing called the Brave lattice. So Brave lattices are essentially a collection of uh, uh, lattice points periodically arranged in space, uh, in this particular case three-dimensional space, where all lattice points are equivalent and any lattice point is reachable from any other lattice point in a manner that we have just discussed with the example of the two-dimensional lattice. So R is what is called as a translation vector which connects any lattice point to any other lattice point we are the three-dimensional unit vectors a1, a2, and a3, and of course n1, n2, n3 are integers. 
It turns out that there are 14 distinct Bravais lattices one can imagine in three-dimensional space. 14 different, 14 different and distinct Bravais lattices in three-dimensional space, which can all be organized into seven crystal systems. We are now systematically going to look into the 14 Bravais lattices and the seven crystal systems and we'll try to understand what is different about uh, these different cases. So before we dive into the 14 Bravais lattices and seven crystal systems, let us make, a, make an important observation. Uh, in three-dimensional space, uh, a unit cell may be defined in terms of the three uh, unit cell vectors. A1, A2, and A3, and we have indicated that those are vectors uh, by putting arrows at the top, right? So A1 vector, A2 vector, A3 vector, they have those arrows in the top. Now, those three quantities can actually be traded off for six other quantities, six other scalars. The first three are the magnitudes of the three vectors a1, a2, a3, which we just represent as a1, a2, a3 without the vectors on top. And the three angles, alpha 1, 2, alpha 2, 3, and alpha 1, 3, which are essentially the angles between any two unit vectors. So the bottom line is that the three vectors a1, a2, a3 can be traded for six uh, numbers, a1, a2, a3, the three magnitudes, and alpha 1, 2, alpha 2, 3, alpha 1, 3, the three angles. With these definitions in place, we are now going to go and take a look at the 14 Bravais lattices and seven crystal systems and see how these six numbers, alpha, the three alphas and the three A's, uh, vary with respect to the choice of the crystal system or the Bravais lattice. So that's the next step. So here they are the Bravi lattices and the crystal systems. So as we, as we just mentioned, um, there are seven crystal systems, which are also called as uh, crystal classes. The most general and the least symmetric of those seven is the one that's called the triclinic, which is, which is, which is what is listed uh, at the very top. And the triclinic system is uh, defined as the crystal system where the three uh, the magnitudes of the three unit vectors a1, a2 and a3 are not equal to each other and the three angles that we just defined earlier are also not equal to each other. So that's what is stated over there. The other crystal systems are systematically more symmetric than the triclinic. For example, the monoclinic system which is the second one in this list over here uh, is again composed of unit cells um, that whose ma the magnitudes of whose unit vectors are not the same. A1 is not equal to A2, not equal to A3. But two of the angles are equal to 90 degrees, and the third one is not 90 degrees, something that's other than 90 degrees. That's the monoclinic system. So that's, in some sense, a special case of the general triclinic system. And the next in line is the orthorhombic where the magnitudes of the unit cell vectors are all different from each other, but all the angles are 90 degrees. Okay. Tetragonal is more symmetric. All the angles are 90 degrees. Uh, two of the unit cell vectors have the same magnitude. A1 is equal to A2, but A3 is different from A1 and A2. Going further down the list, we got the trigonal system, where A1 is equal to A2 equals A3. And all the angles are also equal, but they are all less than 120 degrees. So that's the trigonal system. Moving next to the list, we come to the cubic system, which happens to be uh, uh, the most symmetric of them all. Uh, A1 equals A2 equals A3, and all the angles are equal to 90 degrees, creating a cubic unit cell. And then last in the list is this hexagonal system, which actually should probably be uh, uh, placed a little bit ahead in this list because it is not really uh, necessarily more symmetric than the cubic system. But in this list, it's listed as the last, but no matter. 
Uh, so in the hexagonal system, A1 equals A2, and A3 is something different. Um, two of the angles are 90 degrees, and one of them is 120 degrees. Um, and uh, this basically leads to hexagonal lattice. So those are the seven crystal systems, or crystal classes. Note that some of these crystal systems have multiple unit cells depicted. For example, if you look at the uh, monoclinic, monoclinic system, uh, you've got uh, two choices for the unit cells. Right? One that is called simple or primitive. The P up here um, represents primitive. That's a primitive unit cell. And then you've got another one over here, which is volume centered. So you have lattice points at the corners of the unit cell, at the vertices of the uh, polyhedron that forms the unit cell. But there is also a lattice point at the body center or the volume center. Which is why it's called the volume center. Likewise, the uh, orthorhombic system has four. Right? So there is a simple or the primitive. There is a volume center or body center. There is a base center. Right? There is a base center. And then there is, of course, the face center. And likewise, if you jump ahead to the cubic system, you've got three. There is the simple cubic, which is primitive. And then there is a volume centered or body centered. And then there is a face centered. Now, if you count up all of these unit cells that are that are shown over here, you will find that there are 14 of them, right? So there are 14 pictures up here. Those are the 14 Bravais lattices. It should be borne in mind that not all 14 pictures that you see here represent primitive cells. Only seven of them. Uh, are primitive cells and the other seven are not. Uh, however, it should be noted that even those other seven, which are not primitive cells, the way it is pictured here, they can be uh, represented in terms of uh, uh, primitive cells and unit vectors corresponding to those primitive cells, which is what really makes them Bravais lattices. So we're going to finish up this lecture with a brief discussion of uh, space groups, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. So far in this discussion, we've been mainly concerned with translational symmetry. Uh, we mentioned that a unit cell can be defined, and if the unit cell is translated along the unit vectors, you can uh, essentially recreate the entire lattice. You can tile space, two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Uh, and we also mentioned that um, you can go from any one lattice point to any other lattice point through a translation, which we had defined earlier in terms of the unit, uh, unit vectors. So all that deals with translation. But crystals also can have other types of symmetry, such as rotational, uh, inversion, and reflection. So the rotation, inversion, and reflection symmetries are captured by uh, what are called point groups. So the translational symmetry combined with the point group symmetry gives you what are called space groups. So the point group symmetry is also referred to as point symmetry by some people. And for an isolated system or a molecular system where uh, translational symmetry is irrelevant, the number of uh, point group uh, uh, symmetry is possible uh, uh, is really infinite. How so let me at this point mention what we really mean by group or point group. A group is really a collection of operations that leave a system invariant or unchanged. So if you have a particular molecule, let's say H2O, uh, it has a certain set of uh, uh, symmetry operations that will leave that particular molecule invariant. For example, if you take the plane uh, that contains the H2O molecule, uh, reflection of the system of the molecule with respect to that plane will leave the molecule invariant. So that's one symmetry operation um, that leaves the system invariant and it's an operation that's part of the group, symmetry group that represents that particular molecule. Another one could be a plane that actually bisects the, the molecule and again reflection with respect to that plane 
would leave the molecule invariant. So, an in-depth discussion of groups or point groups is really beyond the scope of what we are uh, discussing here. And so, I just want to mention that uh, um, a group is really a collection of, uh, of symmetry operations that leave the system unchanged. Now, for an isolated molecular system, as I mentioned earlier, there are, you know, infinite number of uh, uh, possibilities uh, that could leave a particular system invariant. And so, there are, in principle, infinite number of point groups. However, when you combine that with translational symmetry, there are only 32 point, group, point groups that are compatible with translational symmetry. So each of the 32 point groups is associated with a crystal system or crystal class and the combination of point groups and translational symmetry leads to a total of 230 space groups. And each of the space groups is essentially a collection of symmetry operations, translational as well as rotational, inversion, reflection symmetry operations that will leave that crystal unchanged. In fact, any crystal, now we're really talking about crystal, you know, which is a lattice plus basis. So any crystal can be uh, uh, placed in one of these 230 space groups. So it's really quite incredible that the all the infinite possible crystals can actually be put in one of these 230 classes. That concludes our lecture for today. Thank you.